the afterglow of last night has not yet lifted. Felt it all day long. Every time I paused to think about what the Lord did, I, I felt that wonderful presence. How many of you know that God is real? By the way, we welcome all of you that are online. Welcome Dillingham and uh, Bristol Bay. By the way, Dillingham, we did a lost lamb crusade in Dillingham uh, several years ago, and if anybody's listening that got saved in that meeting, uh, let me know. Uh, in Dillingham, there's a radio station there that goes all over, and the man that owns that station, uh, while I was there, I found out he was from West Virginia, and when I found out he was from West Virginia, I thought, what are the odds of two people being born in West Virginia in Dillingham, Alaska, slim to none, and uh that first night, the Lord began to talk to my heart and said, I want you to lead him to the Lord because if you don't, no one will ever get through to him. Well, I found out he was quite a character, and that was being gracious. But uh, I was born with a boldness when God puts me on an assignment. I found out where he lived, went over to his house, knocked on the door. He opened the door. He said, uh, who are you? I told him who I was. I said, I'm a fellow hillbilly all the way from West Virginia, flew up just to see you. He said, you were born in West Virginia. I said, yeah, come on in. And he had his wife make a pot of coffee. And uh, he shut that entire radio station down while I was in Dillingham. And when I say shut down, he gave me the invitation that day. He said, you come over, get on the radio anytime you want. I'll preempt all other program. I spent hours over there every day presenting the gospel and uh, presenting music. And uh, we struck up a little hillbilly friendship. And then on the last day, I went into his home. We were having coffee each day and uh, really grew to love the old fella. But I, I just said, listen, can I be straight with you? And he said, well, I don't know that you've been anything else but all week long. I said, well, I said, I've been praying for you every day, and I felt like the Lord spoke to my heart uh, that he wants to make sure you're in heaven and you're not ready, and you know you're not ready, and I know you're not ready, and probably everybody in this part of Alaska knows you're not ready <laughs> from what I've heard. I said, but I love you, and I want you to be ready to meet the Lord, and uh, he hollered to his wife, get over here. And so his wife came to the table and sat down, and uh, before it was all said and done, I'll not tell you the whole story, but uh, I asked him, I said, would you like to repent of sin and receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and be ready to meet the Lord today? And there in his house, I led both he and his wife to the Lord and uh, got them a Bible, both of them. Mailed it back to them, so if by any chance you're still alive and listening in Dillingham, I have not forgotten your kindness to me, sir. And may God reach the, the villages and the remote western villages of Alaska in Jesus' name. All of you that are watching online, we bless you regardless of where you're from. I just feel led by the Spirit. Just raise a hand to heaven on behalf of the remote villages of Alaska. Father, you said in Second Peter 3 and 9, that you are willing that none should perish, but all should come to repentance. And as we have prayed so many times, we come into agreement with these precious Alaskan people that you would send a great spiritual awakening to the native people of this dear state, to the remote regions, to all of those small remote villages with some, just a handful of people, some a few hundred God, we pray that the power and the mercy, the grace of God would not pass them by. We drive out every power of evil, every power of demonic activity. We dare to take authority in prayer and agreement in the name of Jesus that the fires of revival would touch this entire state in the name of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen, amen and Amen. So glad for you that are here tonight. Man, you've done great. Uh, I, I, I know Alaska after 17 years. To get people to come out in the summer in Alaska, uh, it's, it's an amazing feat. 
but you have done so well. Last night the house was pretty well full. Uh, you've done almost as good tonight, but tomorrow night we're going to believe the Lord that not only will the house be full, but when the invitation is given, the altars will be filled as well. Just out of curiosity, a little piece of trivia, a little question, a little test, and be honest with yourself and be honest with God. If I told you that I had a major donor that was connected to this ministry and that tomorrow night that donor was going to do an experiment that for every person that brought an unsaved person to tomorrow night's service that I could give you a check for $100,000, how many of you would make sure that you found somebody and got them into the house of God tomorrow night? That's about 100% from what I can see. But you see, that's the problem. We love money more than we love souls. And we need to turn that around in the kingdom of God because the Bible says in Mark chapter 8, what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his soul? Did you hear what God said in Mark 8? What does it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Listen to what I'm about to say and don't ever forget it. In the economy of God's heart, one soul is worth more than the cumulative value of all of the stuff of earth, all of the gold, all of the diamonds, all of the precious jewels, all of the priceless artwork, ar architecture, everything of value on this planet added together. God said, one soul is worth more than that to me. Because stuff is temporary and souls are eternal. And the church has to have a revelation of that to continue to move in the supernatural power of God. Stuff is temporary. Souls are eternal. So I'm going to pray with you tomorrow. Do your best to get a hold of somebody you know that needs the Lord. Get them into God's house. I'm preaching tomorrow night on the subject, what happens five seconds after you die. What happens five seconds after you die? And I think you're going to be amazed at how much content there is in the Bible on that subject. And uh, the gospel will be clearly presented as it will tonight. Tonight we're speaking on five reasons why the church cannot go through the great tribulation. Just before we open the Bible, they're going to show you a brief vision video of Lost Lamb. And as you watch that, uh, just allow the Lord to speak to your heart, and then we'll get right into the Word of God. disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age.
is cold today. I think we're somewhere in single digits and the wind's blowing. Uh, it's smoking hot and we're right on the equator. vision of Lost Lamb Association, independence upon God. Our goal is to lead one million people to a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And thank you from the very depth of my heart. Our family and staff can't be here, but we thank you for helping us to reach the unreached and for being obedient to the Lord. Second Peter chapter 2, if you have your Bible. If you're sitting next to someone that does not have a Bible, if you'd be kind enough to open up and share with them. I think today was the hottest day in 17 years that I've been to Alaska. I have never, never had a day when I was outside and thought, gee, I wish I was naked. <laughs> it was hot. And, uh, you know, that's one thing about cold. When it's cold, you can just keep putting layers on and putting more clothes on. Uh, but when it's hot, there's only so much naked you can get. And, uh, but it was absolutely beautiful today. I don't know what the temperature was, but uh, Pastor and I had some wonderful fellowship together. And I actually had perspiration on my forehead for the first time in Alaska. And so did you. But uh, anyway, how many enjoyed this beautiful day? How many are thankful for God's goodness and God's creation? How many of you know you live in an incredibly beautiful place? Amen. And so from my heart, thank you for your kindness to me. We don't take that for granted, and it's much appreciated. Amy, in my office, if you're editing, would you start right here? Tonight I'm speaking on the subject of will the church go through the Great Tribulation. I'm preaching on this subject because as you are watching the very last signs of Bible prophecy unfolding before your very eyes, I've noticed that there are a lot of people who have never preached on prophecy and never taught on Bible prophecy. Now all of a sudden, they've got a great revelation on prophecy. But unfortunately, I'm listening to a lot of inerrant teaching. And I'll give you the advice that I've given to many. Don't put your faith and trust in somebody that just started preaching and teaching on eschatology and Bible prophecy two months ago. You need to know that Bible prophecy is an accurate roadmap that will get you from where you're at to where God wants you to be. And I want to preface my remarks by saying that the believer in the last days should never panic. Jesus said in Matthew 24, he said in Luke's gospel and the 21st chapter and in Mark's gospel in the 13th chapter, he said when you see these things happening, don't panic, don't be afraid, don't be anxious. Why? Because your path is a guaranteed path if you're walking hand in hand with the Lord Jesus Christ. And before I read out of 2 Peter chapter 2, those of you that are listening, I want to ask you a question in the infancy of this message. And the question is this. If Jesus Christ were to come tonight, do you know beyond the shadow of a doubt that you'd be ready to meet the Lord? Because let me give to you one of the most important pieces of knowledge that you can ever attain, and here it is. 
There is nothing more important in all of the world than being able to lay your head to the pillow at the end of the day and have a knowing in your heart, I am ready to meet the Lord. I have peace with God. It is well with my soul. And if you have never personally or publicly repented of sin and given your heart to Jesus Christ, this is your occasion to do that, regardless of how old you are or how young you are. I gave my heart to Jesus Christ when I was six years old. I remember it like a video playing in my mind right now. It was an evangelist by the name of L.K. Dodge who was in my father's church holding meetings and I remember him saying, do you have a personal memory of a time when you have given your heart to Jesus? And he went on to say, your mother may be a wonderful Christian, but that doesn't mean you're a Christian. And I saw my mother over on the grand piano on the stage. He went on to say, your father may be a wonderful Christian, but that does not mean you are a Christian. And my father was the pastor of the church, and back in those days, pastors sat in big thrones on the platform behind the podium. And I saw my big old rugged dad sitting there and thinking, my dad's the pastor. But he said, God doesn't have any grandchildren. He only has sons and daughters. And you cannot come into the kingdom of God on the coattails of your parents, you've got to make your own personal decision. And so at the age of six, the Spirit of the Lord made that truth clear to me. And when he gave the invitation, I went forward and I knelt at an altar and I asked Jesus to come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. You may say, what kind of commitment can a six-year-old kid make? I've made one that's lasted me my whole life. There has never never been a falling away. There has never been a wandering from the path. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling. The book of Jude said, and that's the Jesus that I preach. He's just not a stamp on the back of your hand like a club you're visiting on the weekend that wears off after two and a half showers. When he comes into your heart, he brands you with a power that'll never let let you go, never let you off the hook and sustain you all the days of your life. Somebody dare to shout amen. amen. But sadly, many people listen to unqualified teachers, and I don't want to mean uh, in any way, mean to be harsh or arrogant. I'm just telling you that just because somebody picks up a Bible and buys a vinyl banner that says apostle and they're on Facebook, it does not necessarily mean their doctrine's good. You can say amen or ouch. But I'm going to walk you through the Bible and I'm going to dispute a lot of teaching that I'm hearing that is telling people that what we're seeing in our world and seeing in our nation is the beginning signs of the great tribulation and the arrival of the Antichrist is on its heels and so many things. It's one of the common questions in recent months that has come into our office and been directed to me personally as someone who's preached on eschatology for 40 plus years. Are we in the great tribulation or will the church go through the great tribulation? I'm going to challenge you to keep your Bible open because I'm going to cover a lot of material in a short amount of time, but I want you to begin to see these passages so that you'll never have another question mark in your heart on this particular subject. And we're going to start in 2 Peter chapter 2, beginning to read at verse 5. There the Bible said, And God did not spare the ancient world except for Noah and the seven others in his family. Noah warned the world of God's righteous judgment, so God protected Noah when he destroyed the world of ungodly people with a vast flood. Highlight, he destroyed the world of ungodly people. Later, God condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and turned them into heaps of ashes. 
He made them an example of what will happen to ungodly people. Highlight that again. On an example of what is going to happen, not to the righteous and the unrighteous, but what will happen to ungodly people. But God also rescued Lot out of the shameful immorality of the wicked people around him. Yes, Lot was a righteous man who was tormented in his soul by the wickedness he saw and heard day after day. So you see, the Lord knows how to rescue godly people from their trials, even while keeping the wicked under punishment until the day of final judgment. Let's take a moment to pray, and I'm going to ask you to bring your heart and your mind into the presence of the Lord, which is here tonight and wants to speak to you if you'll have ears to listen. Father, in the name of Jesus, we never open up the Holy Bible without a deep awareness of our complete and total dependence upon you and upon the tutelage of the Holy Spirit who leads us and guides us into all truth. Will you help me tonight to make this perplexing question simple and to clarify and to show from your eternal word the very nature and character and mercy of the Lord and your clear prophetic plan in the last days. I pray, Father, that the anointing of the Holy Ghost would speak to every heart in life. Don't let one person within the sound of my voice, those present in this sanctuary, all of those watching online, those that might be listening to this through another means, perhaps our YouTube channel, our podcast channel, wherever, This gospel goes, rescue the lost. Let them feel your conviction and your love and your compassion. Draw them in before it's eternally too late. And in the moments to come when I give the invitation, give them the faith and the courage and the humility to pray and to make today their hour of decision. For we ask it in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Tribulation is a word that we rarely use in our modern society. It's actually taken in the Bible from a Greek word, and if you're a new student of the Bible, your Bible is a a compilation of 66 books. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew, not the Hebrew that they speak today in Jerusalem and in Israel and various parts of the world, but it's a Hebrew language that's called a dead language. It's a Hebrew language that's no longer used. And so it is for the New Testament. Your New Testament manuscripts were written primarily in Greek and some in Aramaic. And the Greek in the New Testament is also a dead language. It's not the Greek that they speak in Greece and other parts of the world today. And so all of the truth of God goes back to Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. And that's where your Bible was translated from. I just want to help you with that because I've met a lot of people in my travels who were convinced that Jesus taught out of a King James Bible. But tribulation is one of those Bible words that we don't use, but from the Greek, it actually is taken from a word that means to crush grain under the weight of a heavy stone. The Greek word would have been very known to those who understood it from Bible times because the Greek word was that stone that was found in almost every village, every town, every community. It was a large, massive, round stone, and there in the granary they would put the various grains in, and this massive stone would roll and crush beneath it everything into a powdery-like substance. So I want you to have the same visual that this was intended to give to the listeners in the first century and prior. 
the great tribulation period that is about to come upon this earth is literally the wrath of God being stored up for judgment for all sin and ungodliness and it's compared to a large stone that will grind people underneath its weight into a fine powder. It is not going to be God slapping the back of the hand. It is God crushing the ungodly without mercy and eternal damnation and wrath. Now for all of you that only want to hear a preacher talk about God as if he wears a Santa suit and hands out peppermint sticks, you're listening to the wrong preacher. Because real love has two sides. Real love has a side. Ask any mom. Find the nicest mom in Alaska. Find the nicest mom in Alaska. And then watch what happens to her if you slap her baby. She'll eat you alive, bones and all. There will be no mercy. Because real love has two sides. Real love has a side of deep, passionate, faithful, loyal, unfailing love. But that same love, when it touches that which is sacred, will rise up and smite you without thought. And God is a God of love, but he is also a God, according to the Bible, of wrath and judgment. And the Bible said the sins of our current world are being stored up for a day of terrible wrath. And that's what the great tribulation is going to be. Now, I don't have time, obviously, and I believe most of you understand this, that, and I'm going to be finished tonight uh, before 9 o'clock, but I don't have time in one single setting to do an exhaustive biblical and theological study of the great tribulation. But I am, if you'll put your gospel seatbelt on, going to cover an incredible amount of material in a short amount of time. So ask the Lord to help you. Now, I want to be honest with you because when I preach the Bible, I think people should preach the Bible and strip their personal bias out of it. I think when you preach and interpret and exegete Scripture, you should take two steps back from whatever denomination you were raised in and ask the Lord, not what did my denominational leaders teach me, but what did the Holy Spirit intend to say through both text and context. So I'm just going to be honest enough to tell you that not all scholars agree on the exact unfolding of tribulation times. There is a... And there are four main ones. I'm not going to go through all of them. Four main ones that you'll hear about. One is called pre-tribulation. And that is that the rapture takes place before the tribulation begins. But there's another view called mid-tribulation. And that's a view that believes that the church goes through the first half of the tribulation, but when the Antichrist defiles the Holy of Holies and betrays his treaty with Israel in Jerusalem at that three and a half year mark where the wrath of God is then turned up to level 10 and Jesus said in the last half of the tribulation, if God did not shorten that period of time that none could survive, there are some that believe the church will go through half of the tribulation but raptured at that three and a half year point. That's called mid-tribulation. Now there's another view called post-wrath tribulation. The short synopsis on these folks is they think they're going through three quarters of the tribulation. I'll just politely say there's very little intelligent scholarship that backs that view. And then there's another view called post-tribulation. And as you might imagine, these people believe the church is going through the entire tribulation and that the rapture takes place at the end of the tribulation. I also find this one difficult to back up with any weight of Scripture because we also have the second coming of Christ. And if the rapture took place at the end of the tribulation and the second coming, it's like we'd be doing a quick U-turn. We'd go up and then turn around and come right back down. And then it leaves no time for the judgments that have to take place after the great tribulation. So without being ungracious, 
I'm just telling you that there are books and teachers and people all over social media that are teaching all of these positions. Most of them don't have a clue as to what they're talking about. Most of them have read a book written by a Sunday school teacher that had no theological training, that just had a personal revelation. Listen to what I'm about to say. When it comes to the interpretation and the preaching of the gospel, your personal revelation is not allowed. Your personal view is not allowed. When you open up the Bible, God said what he meant, and he meant what he said. You can't just read a text. You have to read it in context. And then you have to take two steps back and read it within the total narrative of the Bible. And then you have to take a couple of more steps back and study the author that wrote it and put those pieces together and it's really not that difficult. Now don't miss what I'm about to say. The strong weight of scholarship rests upon the pre- tribulation view. And I'm just being honest with you, I'm going to support that view with the remaining part of this message. As a matter of fact, I have no allowance from my understanding of 50 plus years of studying the Bible intently of anything that I could present to you that I believe would pass the tests of scholarship and biblical interpretation. And when I'm done, I think you'll know why. I had a group of people at the Bible college asked me, they said, how strong are you on the pre-tribulation view of the great tribulation? I said, well, let me put it to you this way. I don't even eat post-cereal. I don't allow post-it notes in my office. I believe we're so close to the rapture that I don't even buy green bananas anymore. And I'm seriously thinking about buying a convertible so I can be one of the first to go. With that said, let me just give you a thumbnail of the chronology of coming Bible prophecy. And if you're taking notes, write this down. The next major event on the chronology of Bible prophecy is an event called the rapture of the church. That is the next major prophetic event on the calendar of Bible prophecy. The Bible calls it the rapture of the church. Now, I've had people that have come to me and said, you're a heretic because the word rapture is nowhere to be found in my Bible. About a year ago, I was here in the state of Alaska on the Kenai Peninsula, and I preached one night on questions on the rapture. And immediately after the service and the altar call, some man came up to me wagging his finger and said, you're a heretic, you're a heretic, you're a heretic. I felt like saying, you're ugly, you're ugly, you're ugly, but I'll keep my opinion to myself. Now, I was trying to be gracious because I believe God wants us to be gracious, and so I was asking the Lord to give me strength not to rip his larynx out. <laughs> and uh, I was able to get it out graciously. Sir, why would you say I'm a heretic? He said, because the word rapture is nowhere in the Bible. Here's my Bible. Show me where the word rapture can be found. I handed his Bible back to him. I said, show me anywhere in your Bible where the word Bible can be found. I'm just pausing to ask God to help me to continue to be gracious. The word Trinity is not in the Bible. The word Bible is not in your Bible. The word rapture is not in your Bible. But in 1 Thessalonians 4, caught up is. And the word rapture is just a theological term for being caught up or being snatched away. It's just a theological term, so don't get bent out of shape. If you would prefer to call it being caught up, help yourself. If you would prefer to call it the great snatching and sudden taking away of the children of the Lord, help yourself. But in theological circles and with people who understand Scripture, it's called the rapture of the church, and you should know that. A man by the name... 
Well, I'm not going to get into that. It'll take too much time, and I'm going to cover the ground and stay on track. So the word rapture, everybody say it's not in the Bible, but caught up is. All right, with that said, let me give you five biblical reasons why we're not going through the Great Tribulation. And uh, you can thank the Lord when you go home because in my life notes, I have 50 strong biblical theological arguments as to why the church can't go through the tribulation. But for sake of time, let me just give you five. Number one, Jesus himself told us so. Jesus himself told us that we are not going through the great tribulation. Now, if you're a new Christian, the last book in the Bible is called the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation partners with an Old Testament book called the book of Daniel. And then Paul wrote two letters to the church at Thessalonica, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. Those four books are the pillars of eschatology or the study of end times. Daniel, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, the book of Revelation. Now prophecy is found throughout the Bible, including the book of Proverbs. People don't think of the book of Proverbs as a prophecy book because it's not. It's a book of wisdom. But there are actually four prophecies in the book of Proverbs. One of which is in the fourth chapter that says the path of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. So until the rapture of the church and the final judgment and entering into God's perfect eternity, the path of the just shines brighter and brighter. When you repent of sin and get right with Jesus, your path may have been dark when you came into the house, but it's about to get bright when you exit the house. And it'll get brighter and brighter as you walk with the Lord. In the book of Revelation, from chapter 2 in the book of Revelation, verse 1, through chapter 3 and verse 22, you would read seven personal letters to seven actual churches. Now those seven letters to seven churches were personal letters to actual churches. All of those seven churches were located in close proximity to the Isle of Patmos, which is off of the coast of modern-day Turkey. And those churches were located in a region of the world then called Asia Minor. But those, though, were personal letters to actual churches. They are also letters that are prophetic to the seven stages of the church age the way they were divinely given and supernaturally written, they not only were personal letters to actual churches, but they were seven stages of the church age. And we today are living in the time of Laodicea, a lukewarm church that was rich and increased with goods and had need of nothing. But the Bible said, Know you not that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. There's a time in the church when we feel that we've got it all under control, but you must never forget that from the day you're born till the day you die, you are dependent upon the power and the grace and the mercy and the provision vision and the covenant of God to get you through life. Can you say a big amen? Amen. Turn to Revelation chapter 3 and verse 10. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 10. Jesus said, because you have obeyed my command to persevere, I will protect you from the great time of testing that will come upon the whole world to test those who belong to this world. Those are the words of Jesus. The great time of testing is the tribulation. Notice what Jesus said. Because you've obeyed my command to persevere, those that endure, those that don't give up on God, Those that don't backslide. Those who don't trade their salvation for some alcohol and a night of sex at the local hotel. Those who are faithful to the house of God. 
those who live faithfully and loyally to the commandments of Christ. Jesus said, because you obeyed and because you persevered, I will protect you from, highlight the word from. I will protect you from the great time of testing that will come upon the whole world to test those who belong to this world. Jesus didn't say, and that word that I asked you to highlight, protect you from, the word from in the original language, it didn't say I'll keep you through the tribulation or I'll keep you in the time of tribulation, but literally I will keep you from the great tribulation. So number one, Jesus himself told us. And as long as we're in the beginning of the book of Revelation, turn to chapter 1 and verse 3. God blesses the one who reads the words of this prophecy to the church. That's me. No doubt it's one of the reasons why God has blessed lost lamb. No doubt. Not because of me, not because of gifts, not because of talents, not because of skills, not because of things I have done, but because for 40 years I have diligently been faithful to preach on Bible prophecy, there is a blessing to all who read the words of this prophecy to the church. Now here's you. And he blesses all who listen to its message and obey what it says, for the time is near. The book of Revelation is the only book of 66 books in your Bible that guarantees a supernatural blessing from God to those who will pay attention to what it says. Following and listening to Bible prophecy releases a different level of blessing in your life, in your family, in your children, in your business, in your home. So I just wanted to encourage you tonight, even if this is all new to you or even if this is somewhat confusing to you, just by hungering and respecting and making room for God and the Bible and a message on prophecy tonight, there is a special guaranteed blessing of God in the house tonight that comes upon you now like dew in the early morning that nothing can steal from you if you hear it and if you obey it. Number two, the book of Revelation told us. Think about that. The only book in the Bible that has an incentive for studying and reading. A guaranteed special blessing for those who study end time prophecy. I always tell people in my travels, I would love to be your trusted voice in Bible prophecy. Because as I grew in the things of the Lord, I had a trusted voice in Bible prophecy, a few. But it seems like in the last days there are less and less who have devoted their life to making sure this message is taught carefully and prayerfully. That's why I always honor pastors like your pastor who love their congregations enough to bring a voice into the sacred desk that preaches to the vision and deposits the seeds of Bible prophecy in the house. Churches that have pastors that are wise enough to bring in guest ministries that deposit the seeds of Bible prophecy into the house, deposit the supernatural blessing of Revelation 1 and 3, not only upon the house, not only upon the church, but upon all of the congregation who come and listen. If you believe it and receive it, would you shout a big amen? But the book of Revelation is also the only book in the Bible that gives us a perfect outline for its content. And that outline is found in that same first chapter as well in the 19th verse. There the Bible says, write down what you have seen, both the things which are now happening and the things that will happen. There is the threefold outline for the entire vision given to John on the Isle of Patmos. Number one, the things which you have seen, if you're taking notes. And that's in chapter one. The things which thou 
has seen. All of that contained in chapter 1. And then it says the things which are. That's contained in chapters 2 and chapter 3. And then verse 19 said, and the things that will happen or the things that will be. And that begins at chapter 4 and goes through chapter 22. So the entire outline of the vision is given in simplistic form because I believe that God wanted every Christian, regardless of level, to begin to understand at least the fundamentals of Bible prophecy. Don't miss this. The word church is found 19 times from the Greek ecclesia. It's found 19 times in the first three chapters of the book of Revelation. Don't miss this solid gold to understanding the book of Revelation. The word church from the Greek, ecclesia, found 19 times in the first three chapters of the book of Revelation. But it is never found again until the closing salutation of chapter 22 at the end of the book. Why? Because it's not there. Chapters chapter 4 through chapter 19 in Revelation deal with the unfolding events, the judgments, the plagues, the destruction, and the apocalyptic horrors of the great tribulation. All of the great tribulation. It begins in chapter 4 and goes all the way through chapter 19. But not one time is the word ecclesia in the original or the word church in proper translation. Not one time is the word church found after Revelation chapter 3 and verse 22. Not one time. How many of you know that God knows what he's doing? How many of you know that God gave us the Bible? Perfect, inerrant, infallible. An intelligent scholar has to ask themselves a blank question. Why would God not include the word church or any reference to the church from chapter 4 through chapter 19 during the entirety of the unfolding of the great tribulation? The last time the church is mentioned is Revelation 3 and verse 22. One of the great prophecy scholars that is in my library, his name is Dr. Richard Mayhew. And uh, let me just read it to you word for word. Quote, Dr. Mayhew said, It is remarkable and totally unexpected that John would shift from detailed instructions for the church to absolute silence about the church. If in fact... The church continued into the great tribulation. If the church will experience the great tribulation, then surely the most detailed study of tribulation events would include an account of the church's role. But it does not because the church is not there. End of quote. Now, many of my friends that are scholars and have PhDs and even professors at the Bible college that I chair in discussion sometimes, and this is a common question that gets addressed to me, uh, well, Tiff, how do you explain persecution and tribulation? Some have even gone as far as to say, how convenient for you to say that the church isn't going through great tribulation because you live in America, whereby in recent history, they have not seen tribulation in America. But around the world, the church has been in tribulation. The church has been in horrible persecution. Christians have been burned alive. They've been beheaded. They've been tortured. They've been eliminated. They've been exposed to things unspeakable in public viewings like this. How convenient for you to say that the church isn't going through the great tribulation. Only a preacher in America would say that. Well, that's a good question. But how many of you know that in intelligent debate, you don't have to run away from intelligent questions? 
So is there anything in the Bible that would answer that? Because that is, listen, that is perhaps the strongest argument that all of the other views use to introduce their view. Well, it's inconsistent to preach or to teach pre-tribulation because throughout church history, the church has gone through tribulation and persecution and does to this day. They're being killed in countries I could name as I speak. John chapter 16, verse 33, the Bible said, In this world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. And that's a passage that they'll oftentimes pull out to refute the pre-tribulation view. Now, if somebody hasn't loved you enough to open the Bible and walk you through that, 99.9% of Christians really don't have a theological, biblical, intelligent answer to that, and the thought goes through their spirit and their mind, well, maybe I've jumped the gun on this subject. So three things I want to help you with. Number one, there is a significant difference. Now listen, if you're taking notes, don't miss these three. Because I promise you there will be a time in your life when somebody will ask you these questions. So number one, there is a significant difference between the historic persecution and tribulation the church has endured and the great tribulation prophesied in the book of Revelation. Significant difference. Second, the historic persecution and tribulation against the church has been persecution by the hands of men, not by the wrath of God. And it has always been regional, and it has always been cultural, but it has never been global. Very important. How many understand that? Say an amen. Amen. Third, the coming great tribulation is going to be global. The great tribulation of the book of Revelation that begins its unfolding in Revelation 4 and goes through Revelation chapter 19. The great tribulation, capital T, is going to be global. And although man will play a role, the great tribulation of Revelation 4 through 19 is not executed by the hands of men, but it is wrath like a great stone that pulverizes into powder executed by Almighty God. Now when you explain that to somebody, it's very simple to see. But if nobody has ever taught you that, or walked you through that, then many people fall into the trap of the other confusing teachings that are inerrant. So let me give them to you one more time quickly. Number one, in this world, John 16, 33, in this world ye shall have tribulation. That's not the great tribulation. It's tribulation. It's persecution. It's abrasive uh, relationships culturally. And, and worse. But it is not the great tribulation prophesied in the book of Revelation. You have to remember that John, who wrote the gospel of John, wrote his book before the book of Revelation was written. So there had never even been a revelation of the great tribulation when John wrote his gospel. The last book written of the 66 books, and by the way, they're not in the order of which they were written. The oldest book in the Bible is actually the book of Job. But the last book written in the canon of Scripture, and by canon of Scripture we mean the books that had passed all of the tests of historicity and authenticity, and they made their way into the closed canon of Scripture. The book of Revelation was the last book written around 96 A.D. So when John said, in this world ye shall have tribulation, the book of Revelation had not even been written. The great tribulation had not even been revealed. Therefore, it cannot cross-contaminate an exegesis. Are you still with me? 
I don't want to go too deep on this. I'm not teaching at the Bible college, but I believe Christians have been underestimated as to how intelligent the body of Christ is, and I refuse to preach dumb messages. I trust the body of Christ to be taught by the Holy Spirit when they're given the Word of God in context. Second, the historic persecution that the church has always seen, small t, small tribulation, has always been regional, always cultural, always carried out by the hands of men. But thirdly, the great tribulation revealed in the book of Revelation is not cultural, it's not regional. It's not carried out by the hands of men. It'll be worldwide, it'll be global, and it will be carried out and executed by Almighty God. If you believe it and receive it, give God a mighty hand of praise. In the entirety of the New Testament, in the entirety of the New Testament, there is not one single passage to warn Christians of the coming great tribulation or any instructions on how to prepare for it. If God had planned for the church and for his bride to go through any or all of the great tribulation, isn't it incredibly insensitive and odd that he didn't give one single instruction, one single warning, one single word of encouragement, one single word of preparation, one single word of advice for your families and for the bride of Christ to go through such a horrible period? And the reason that he didn't is obvious to all. The church is not going through. He's not going going to allow his bride to be beaten, beheaded, and bloodied and bruised. The bride will be pure and white and holy and undefiled. Praise God. I got to move quickly. Number three, every Bible example told us. Number one, Jesus told us. Number two, the book of Revelation told us. And number three, every Bible example told us. Now, if you were to go to seminary or Bible college, you'd take courses called typology. And a type taken from the Greek word typo simply means a person, an event, an institution in the redemptive history of the Old Testament that prefigures a corresponding greater reality in the New Testament. A type is a copy, a pattern, a model that signifies a greater reality. You say, where in the world is that taught? Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. The Bible said the old system under the law of Moses was only a shadow, a dim preview of the good things to come not the good things themselves. The sacrifices under that system were repeated again and again, year after year, but they were never able to provide perfect cleansing for those who came to worship. If they had been provided for perfect cleansing, the sacrifices would have stopped, for the worshipers would have been purified once and for all time, and their feelings of guilt would have been disappeared. So typology is actually taught in the Bible. Let me just give you a handful, and again, pardon me for running through this. Uh, this would be a subject I'd love to do an entire week on, and even then I wouldn't be able to cut the meat off all of the bone. But number one, Enoch. Enoch in the Bible was a type of pre-tribulation. He was transferred to heaven before the flood. Methuselah. How many of you know that Methuselah was the oldest man on the face of the earth? That was Noah's grandfather. Methuselah's son, Lamech, was Noah's father. The name Methuselah means, and by the way, Methuselah was named by a prophet of God. When Methuselah was born, a prophet came to the home and said his name shall be Methuselah. Because Methuselah in the Hebrew means judgment comes when he dies. That's what Methuselah means in the Hebrew. When he dies, judgment will come, or judgment comes when he dies. He lived 969 years. This is a sermon even in its own weight. 
but don't miss it. God allowed him to live longer than any other man because the judgment of God always allows for the largest window of mercy possible. Some scholars tell us that Methuselah died seven days before the flood. Noah's grandfather Methuselah, whose name was given by a prophet at birth, his name meaning when he dies, judgment follows, judgment comes, dies seven days before the flood. And God gave him seven days because the ritual was seven days of mourning. So Methuselah dies, the prophet has to be carried out as the word of the Lord. When he dies, judgment comes. God allows him 969 years, the longest man who ever lived, giving the opportunity for grace and mercy and redemption to a world gone bad. The longest window of mercy ever extended. But when he died, the word of the Lord has to be fulfilled. God allows the righteous seven days for mourning this man's life. And then the flood. It's interesting to note that both Lamech and Methuselah were alive when Noah was building the ark, but God took them both home before the flood. Because God always rescues the godly before judgment. And then even Noah. Noah and the ark is a type of the pre-tribulation. What was the ark made out of? Wood. It's a type of the cross. How many doors did God tell Noah that the ark was allowed to have? One and only one. Why? Because there's only one way to be right with God. Jesus said, I am the door. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And no one can come to the Father except through me. Just as the only way onto the ark was through the one door, the only way to the ark of God's forgiveness and safety and salvation is through the door, Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And when the floodwaters of judgment broke from the depth of the earth and rained down from the sky, and the entire world was flooded and destroyed, what happened to the ark when judgment came down? The righteous went up. They rose above the floodwaters of judgment. Even the story of Noah and the ark is a type of the pre-tribulation chronology of God. How about Lot and his family? Lot and his family were in a wicked world called Sodom and Gomorrah, but before God sent the fire of judgment, he sent an angel. Genesis 18, verse 25. Surely you wouldn't do such a thing, destroying the righteous along with the wicked. This is Abraham having a discussion with God about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham's negotiating with God. He said, surely you wouldn't do such a thing, destroying the righteous along with the wicked. Even Abraham knew the chronology of God. He went on to say, why would you be treating the righteous and the wicked exactly the same? Surely you can't do that because you're the judge of the all earth, of the whole earth, and you do what is right. So even Abraham in the Old Testament knew the chronology of God's workings. And he said, you can't do that. You're the judge of all of the earth. And because you're righteous in your ways, you cannot expose the righteous to the same judgment as the ungodly. You can't do it because you're a God of justice. In a world of injustice, don't you ever forget God is a God of justice. I have a word for the Lord for all of us that are in this time in which we're heading into the great tribulation. Don't trade evangelism for activism. We're in a precarious place in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ where I have watched many pastors, many ministers, many spiritual leaders broken my heart and been disappointed. The Bible already teaches us that we have an obligation to the injustice and to those of all colors around the world. But in these last days, don't let the devil steal evangelism out of the church and replace it with activism.
God knows how to take care of this world. I'll not go down that path any further. The Bible says that the firstborn of every member of the Hebrew children living in Egypt were protected and spared as the judgment of God was carried out. Though judgment fell on the ungodly, all of the innocent were protected and rescued. I can't believe that it's three minutes till the top of the hour. How many would be gracious to give me a few more moments? Matthew chapter 13, verse 27. The farmer's workers went to him and said, Sir, the field where you planted that good seed is full of weeds. Where did they come from? An enemy has done this, the farmer exclaimed. Should we pull out the weeds, they asked. No, he replied, you'll uproot the weed if you do. Let both grow together until the harvest. Then I will tell the harvesters to sort out the weeds, tie them into bundles and burn them and put the wheat in the barn. At harvest time, God always separates the wheat from the tares. Pardon me for trying to bite this all off in one night. I move quickly. Number four, the love of God told us. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The Apostle Paul assured his readers that once they had repented of sin and received the gift of salvation, they had no more reason to ever fear the judgment of God. Romans chapter 8, verse 1, Paul said, There is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ. The purpose of the great tribulation is twofold. Somebody asked me that question not long ago. Very intelligent minister friend of mine. He said, do you believe that there's some specific purpose for the great tribulation? I said, actually, biblically, there's two very distinct reasons for the purpose of the great tribulation. The first is to purify Israel and the Jewish people. Don't ever forget this in your understanding Bible prophecy. Bible prophecy primarily is not about the church. It's about Israel. It's about the Jewish people. Fundamentally and firstly, Bible prophecy is about God's original covenant to the Jewish people. We've been adopted through the cross of Christ according to Galatians chapter 3. The Bible said, who are the true Jews? Those that have received Jesus Christ and repented of sin are adopted into the family. There is neither male nor female. There is neither Greek nor Jew and so on. The Bible tells us that through Christ we were adopted into that perfect covenant. Don't have time to go down that road. But the purpose of the great tribulation twofold. Number one, to purify Israel and the Jewish people. And secondly, to execute final, complete, and total wrath upon the ungodly once and for all. Those are the two reasons. The great tribulation will be a time to execute wrath and judgment on all who rejected God and His Son, Jesus Christ. Believers have not rejected God's love. Believers have not rejected the forgiveness of the Lord. We've not rejected the mercy of the Lord. What would be the logical or spiritual point of having his children endure the punishment of the great tribulation after he sent his son Jesus to endure our punishment on the cross? It does not make neither logical nor theological sense. For God to tell us that he sent his only son to redeem us from judgment and then to drag us through the worst judgment in human history doesn't make logical sense, let alone theological sense. When you get saved, you're immediately forgiven of all your sin. You're immediately given a brand new life with a clean record. You immediately become exempt from the coming judgment and the wrath of God. And that includes the wrath and judgment of God that will soon be executed upon this planet during a seven-year window of time called the Great Tribulation. Lastly, and I close with this. The blood of Jesus tells us, praise God. The blood of Jesus tells us, Romans chapter 5 verse 9, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. 
For if when we were his enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his son much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his blood. When God sent his son and allowed him to be crucified on the cross, there the sinless lamb of God paid for the penalty and the full penalty of all our sins. 2 Corinthians 5 and 7, if any man or woman comes to Christ, they become a brand new creature. Old things pass away and all Things become new. There is no more judgment upon the believer for the blood of Jesus Christ did the work completely. Old things passed away. All things become new. Old things passed away. All things become new. The moment you stand at this altar with me tonight and repent of your sin and by faith receive Jesus, you have a new life in Christ and there is no more judgment upon your name or upon your title. The blood of Jesus tells us. I love that old hymn. Jesus painted all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He was it white as snow. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Give the Lord a mighty hand of praise. Those who teach that the church will go through the great tribulation not only degrade, but they disavow the efficacy of the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It paid it all. Did the cross save us from sin or not? Did the cross save us from condemnation or not? Did the cross save us from wrath or not? Did the cross save us from judgment or not? One scholar wrote, quote, One is forced to ask, How could the Lamb of God die and rise again to save the church from wrath and then allow the church to go through that wrath that he'll pour out on those who reject him. Such inconsistencies might be possible in the theology of men, but it is impossible in the thinking of Almighty God. If you believe and receive it, stand to your feet and raise your hands to God on high. Out loud say, thank you, Father, that I have been cleansed, forgiven from all sin. There is no wrath awaiting me, but only the peace of God afforded to sons and daughters. In Jesus' name, I'm going to give my invitation. I want to do so by reading a passage of Scripture. Because this is something that I would consider. As a matter of fact, I have an entire evangelistic crusade message on the subject entitled The Most Frightening Prophecy in the Bible. And the most frightening prophecy in the Bible to me is that the Bible seems to clearly teach that everyone who had an opportunity to receive Jesus before the rapture cannot be saved after the rapture. And I'm going to show you this in the Bible before we give the invitation. But I want you to hear that clearly. Now, don't anybody leave and say, Brother Tiff said no one's going to be saved in the Great Tribulation, because that's not what I said. A great multitude will be saved in the Great Tribulation. The greatest revival and harvest of souls in the history of humanity will take place in the Great Tribulation. 
But I said all who had an opportunity to be saved before the rapture but rejected it or backslid. And the rapture takes place. There is no way for you to be saved after the rapture. And I've heard many through the years say, well, you know, at least if I miss the rapture, I know enough about the Bible, I'll not take the mark of the beast. I'll die before I take the mark of the beast because I know what that means. That means the wrath and judgment of God and hell forever and forever. First of all, let me ask you just a straightforward civil question. If you didn't have the strength to live for Jesus this side of the rapture, Thank you, Lord, for helping me with that. If you did not have the strength to live for Jesus this side of the rapture, where do you think you're going to have this sudden Superman strength to be beheaded? You couldn't pray in a church surrounded by Christians, and now all of a sudden you think you've got this incredible character to be beheaded for your faith? But that's not the point. The point is you can't get saved anyway. If you had a clear opportunity to be saved before the rapture, but you rejected it, and I'm not talking about everybody that heard the Bible on the radio or TV or the Internet, but people who have heard the preaching of the gospel clear and strong and have felt the calling and the conviction of the Holy Spirit and are given an opportunity to receive Christ but walk out the back doors in five minutes and reject it, if the rapture were to take place, there is no way for you to be saved after that. Well, let me just show you in the Bible because so many of you have already got the moose in the headlights look. 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 and 10. Listen to it carefully. This man, speaking of the Antichrist after the rapture, this man, the Antichrist, will come to do the work of Satan with counterfeit power and signs and miracles. And he will use every kind of evil deception. How many of you remember when I taught you on Bible prophecy, always, always highlight the word deception? How many remember that? Key tool of the Antichrist as well. He, the Antichrist, will use every kind of evil deception to fool those. That just simply refers to a group of people. He's going to fool a group of people. Fool those who are on their way to destruction. So there's a group of people that are on their way to destruction. Why are they on their way to destruction? Because they refuse to love and accept the truth that would save them. Refuse, past tense. You can't refuse something unless you had an opportunity. And you refuse the opportunity. What's the opportunity? To love and to accept the truth that would save them. So this is one passage in the Bible that makes it seemingly... I mean, I've discussed this with scholars all over the world where I've traveled. Many of them actually said, I, I never even saw that verse before. But as we've studied the scriptures together, I've never had one who could dismiss that because it's just that clear. The Antichrist, after the rapture, deceives a group of people that are on their way to destruction. The Bible says who those people are. They were people who refused to accept the truth that would save them. The only thing that can save us is the gospel. They had an opportunity to receive the gospel but refused it. But the rapture's taken place and the Antichrist is on earth and nobody taught those people that you can't come to Jesus when you want to. So I've got to teach you that before we pray. You can't come to Jesus when you want to. You can only come to Jesus when the Father draws you. How many know that's in the Bible? The only way a man, a woman, a boy or girl, or you personally... The only way you can get right with God is the Father has to draw you. What is the protocol of God drawing people? Through the foolishness of preaching, the power of God unto salvation. Tonight you've sat under the foolishness of preaching and the gospel has been made clear. And in an opportunity like that, only the Father then can tug at your heart with compassion and conviction. 
But if you refuse it and go out the back door without making peace with God and the rapture were to take place tonight, you then fall under the great deception of the Antichrist with no hope. Trust me, I've studied this passage hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours. I've gone through I don't know how many different commentaries from brilliant Bible scholars trying to find some way but then when you read the other passages in the Bible, it backs it up. Hebrews 6, verses 4 and 6. It's impossible to bring back to repentance those who were once enlightened, those who experienced the good things of heaven, shared in the Holy Spirit, tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the power of the age to come, who then turn away from God. It is impossible to bring such people back to repentance. For by rejecting the Son of God, they themselves are nailing Him to the cross once again and holding Him up to public shame. You see, proper biblical interpretation, there has to be more than one passage. Hebrews 10, 26, Dear friends, if we deliberately continue sinning, after we have received a knowledge of the truth, there is no longer any sacrifice that can cover these sins, there is only the terrible expectation of God's judgment for the raging fire that will consume His enemies. Now, I know that's heavy. I know that's heavy. Even as I've preached it, and I've preached it for 40 years, every time I take a moment to try to explain that to an audience, I feel the weight of that in my spirit, man. I mean, literally. It's a frightening passage. To me, it's the most frightening prophecy in all of the Bible that those who had an opportunity where the invitation of the Holy Spirit by the calling of the Father called them to a place to get right with God and they walked out the back door of a service like this in America where you have the freedom to come and kneel and pray without persecution and hundreds of people who rejoice with you that you're making things right. The Bible says the rapture takes place in the twinkling of an eye. A group of engineers at General Electric calculated that at one twelve thousandths of a second. That's a group of men with far too much free time on their hands. <laughs> the twinkling of an eye. Well, you know what that means to me? That's not enough time to pray. That's not enough time to repent. That's not enough time to go on YouTube. That's not enough time to call your pastor, and any pastor left behind is not worth talking to anyway. They're going to hell just like you are. That is how quick. When the rapture takes place, you will either be taken or you'll be left behind. And the decision of your eternal address has to be made under the anointing of the preached gospel by the calling of the Father and a humble heart that says, I'm a sinner. Forgive me. Come into my heart. Be Lord and Savior. I want you to do that tonight. Some of you that will pray with me, it might be the very first time you've ever prayed a sinner's prayer. Trust me, this preacher loves you. I preach like this because I don't want you to go to hell. I take time to extend the invitation and follow the pull and the pulse of the Holy Spirit because I sincerely want to be able to go to bed tonight without thinking I rushed that because I was concerned about this, that, or the other. I care about you. I love you. This pastor loves you. Pastors don't hold meetings like this unless they love the lost. How many churches in Alaska are having church every single night? to gather in the last day harvest knowing that we're watching final Bible prophecy fulfilled all around us. This is a special house. This is a special time and you're in a special place and tonight's your special night. I'm not going to embarrass you. This isn't about becoming Protestant. This isn't about becoming Catholic. This is about becoming right with God. This is about receiving Jesus Christ. This is about being ready to meet the Lord. This is about forgiveness through the blood of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to ask you in just a moment to come to this altar and to pray with me publicly. 
People always ask me, why do you always ask people to pray with you publicly? I had a news reporter in a big crusade ask me, do you really feel like there's something special about you that if people walk up and surround you? You know, cocky little question, and I asked God for grace. I said, it has nothing to do with me. Jesus said, and this is exactly what I told her, I said, I do it because Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, if you confess me publicly before men, I'll confess you publicly before my Father, which is in heaven. But if you are ashamed of me before men, I'll be ashamed of you before the Father and the angels. Everybody Jesus called in the Bible, he called publicly. Every apostolic sermon in the Bible, they called the people publicly. These churches that don't have a backbone to give an invitation for people to be saved and say, just stand right there. You don't even have to move your lips. Just think it in your head. Let me tell you something. Camouflage prayers produce camouflage Christians, and Jesus isn't returning for camouflage Christians. It takes courage to come forward. It'll take faith and humility to come forward. But listen, you will never regret the day that you made peace with God according to the Bible. You will never regret the day you made peace with God according to the Bible. In just a moment as I give this invitation, listen carefully to these instructions. Whether you're coming for the first time in your life or you're a backslider and you're away from the Lord and you need to come home, I always ask those that have the courage, you be the very first ones to come because your courage is going to help somebody that doesn't have the same courage you have. That's just human nature. So those of you that have that kind of backbone and courage, you be ready. You be the first ones. You'll help somebody. Maybe your own family member. Maybe your own brother, your sister, your wife, your husband. Christian, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. If you're a Christian and you're right with God, I want you to take sensitive inventory of the people that are sitting around you. And if there's someone near you and you're not certain that they've ever made their own personal and public commitment to Christ, as people are gathering, you turn to them and say, I'll walk with you. And you can come forward with them. And then we're going to pray what many people call a sinner's prayer. And tonight's your night. Now listen, if you want to be ready to meet the Lord, you don't want to face the wrath of God in a seven-year window of time about to come upon this earth called the Great Tribulation. And you want to know that it's well with your soul. There's only one door into the ark. And by coming to this altar, you're saying, it's Jesus. You start coming right now, and we'll pray. Come on as they say. God speaking to your heart. Come on. Father's arms are open wide. No one's too young, no one's too old. The precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Anyone else? They're still coming. Crowding a little closer. The precious blood of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. Come on in just a little tighter. There's still a few more coming in behind you. When I walk down the aisle into this sanctuary tonight and I walk by you, I knew 100% of my heart tonight was your night. And the only reason I'm singling you out is there's something that's gone on in your life that's made you think that this could never be possible. But there literally is a power in Jesus Christ where you're going to become a brand new person and you'll never be the same. And when the Bible said old things pass away, it means everything in your past. None of it goes forward with you from this day forward. Newness of life, that's the glorious power of God. 
Those of you that are at this altar, pray this prayer out loud from your heart. Listen, you're not praying to me or with me. You're literally talking to God. The only reason I ask people to pray a prayer with me is because I meet multiple thousands of people in my travels that have never been to church, don't know how to pray, wouldn't even know where to begin. But the Bible says, not me, God, the Bible says, all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's God's eternal promise. Just close your eyes and talk to the Father and say this, Heavenly Father, tonight as I was listening to the Bible, you were speaking to me. Down deep in my heart, I want to be a real Christian. I want to live ready. In these last days, keep me ready for your soon coming. I admit my sin. The Bible said all have sinned. And that includes me. But tonight I'm trusting in your grace. I trust in your mercy. I'm trusting in the cross and in your son Jesus. Forgive me. Wash me in the blood. Cleanse me. Make me holy in your eyes. Cleanse my mind. Cleanse my body. Cleanse my spirit. Make me holy and pure. I receive Jesus Christ and the gift of salvation. And I surrender my life to you, to your will, to your ways, and to your eternal word. In place of my weakness, give me your strength. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. I vow this night, I will serve the Lord. No turning back. I ask you to help me to win my family to Jesus, to win my loved ones to Jesus. Let my life blaze a trail that all who follow in my footsteps will follow me to heaven. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Give God a mighty hand of praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Listen carefully. Pastor Daniel's coming. He's going to speak to you. I want you to listen carefully to his instructions. We love you. We appreciate you. I'm just saying tomorrow night's the last night. Please bring somebody with you that needs the Lord. And let's have the greatest night of salvation, restoration of this entire week of meetings. Tomorrow night I'm preaching on the subject. What happens five seconds after you die? I love you from the bottom of my heart. I'll see you tomorrow, Pastor. Go and put your hands together for Tiff. Here's what I'd like to do. Um, Pastor Kirsten, would you just come up on the platform? This is Pastor Kirsten Davis. He's going to lead you. All of you that came up, would you just take, give us a few moments of your time? We're going to head right down into the, into the lobby there. Pastor Vince is there. Follow Pastor Kirsten, would you? All right, wonderful. Whichever aisle you go, just meet us over into the lobby right now. Just taking three minutes of your time. Put your hands together for these guys, won't you? Come on, you can do a little bit better than that. I've got leaders and people helping out there. You may be seated. Wonderful. How many of you know when a new baby is born, that baby needs some help? And uh, people have been born again tonight, giving their hearts to Jesus. Their name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and we're going to help them grow and become big and strong in God. Can you say amen? Amen. amen? amen. The discipleship process starts now with them. And uh, ushers, would you kindly close those doors? And... Uh, Help me out, please. Thank you. We're going to go ahead and give into the ministry of Lost Lamb Association, Evangelist Tiff Shuttlesworth. The entirety of this gift will go, the entirety of your offering will go 
into that ministry. We send them with one check for all of these different meetings. If you're not prepared to give tonight, you can give tomorrow night, and uh, you can give online. There's four different ways, in fact, to give. You can give through the website. You can give through the app. And you can give through uh, text to give. There we go. Website, app, text, or the uh, envelope. Ushers, would you help us out, please? Thank you. If you need an envelope, go ahead and get their attention. Vic, would you help me and go help in that lobby in whatever way? Appreciate that. What a word. I feel like I ate a giant meal. Just so full, so much word, so much revelation. Amazing. So glad you came tonight. Hey, Tiff, thank you. Love you too. Don't miss again tomorrow night. All right, you ready? This is our way of showing love, and it's a biblical thing to do. All right, ushers, would you come? Glad I'm saved. Hate to be crushed to powder by some tribulation stone. Come on, somebody say hallelujah. <laughs> I'm not going to backslide either. How about you? You ain't going to backslide either. Oh, I made up that decision a long time ago. What a great, great word. Father, we thank you. We receive the word tonight. Your guest. You're really one of your generals, our guest, or our dear friend. I pray that you would bless him as we sow into the ministry. I'm just so touched by seeing the nations in that video. People impacted by the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. May our giving now fuel him forward to reach the goal of a million souls for Christ. Fuel him forward into the nations and all the different places that we go. Thank you for the integrity of this ministry and this man and this family. Thank you, Lord, for the integrity of the righteous man. So bless the gift and the giver, I pray, even a hundredfold. In Jesus' name, amen.